Well, good morning. Good morning. Again. How about that? It's going to take me a little bit uh, getting used to. I'll try not to blast your ears out. I do have this slight issue where I'm really loud. Um, so, like, right now, it's kind of a whisper. So, I'll try not to, like, talk too much. So, um, Pastor Mike uh, approached me a couple months ago. I'm also getting used to this wire thing here. So, just bear with me. Uh, he, t- he approached me a couple months ago and said, Hey, would you, uh, would you want, be willing, able to preach for me on the December 27th? And I was super excited, um, humbled. I was, I was very excited. Yesterday was my birthday, so this is kind of a birthday present for me. So, yeah, thank you. Uh, but, but he did, he did the thing that, that every, every, Fill in, pastor loves to happen. Luke can contest this. This is what he said. He said, you can preach on whatever you like. And I was like, oh boy. Thankfully, in that same time, he also mentioned like four times. Mind you, it was like a two-minute conversation. Four times he mentioned, I don't know if you want to preach about the coming new year, but you can preach on whatever you like. (laughs) Well, I'm not just... uh, ordinary guy off the street. I mean, I'm just a guy off the street, but uh, I, for those who don't know, we've, we've been coming since May. Um, maybe it's a little before that. Now I'm, now I'm confusing myself. April? We start, April. We'll go with April. Uh, yeah, April. And uh, prior to being here, I served as the, the pastor, the senior pastor at the Lexington Church of Nazarene. And before that, I was a senior pastor at the Fulton Crossroads Church in Nazarene. Um, and, and also, other times, served as associate. I was ordained to the Church of Nazarene as an elder of the Church of Nazarene in 2011. Um, so there, there's my credibility for you there. Um, done about that. So, all right. Uh, so so he, he, he said, you know, preach on something, whatever you like. But if you like, you know, New Year's coming up, you know, it's right before New Year's, so... Maybe you want to preach about the new year, something along those lines. Um, but I have this real struggle, isn't the right word, but quirk, I guess. It, it became almost like a game to me. I and mean, those who, who know me know I like, to, I, I, I like to turn everything into a game. And not necessarily like a, a, a game like you would think, but I, I turn it into a challenge in my mind. Um, it, it's, just, it's just how I operate. Um, at, at my new position, at a job I work right now, I work for J.P. Morgan Chase and we have these scorecards, and on the scorecards, it's, it's about, it takes metrics from your calls, because I, I work at a call center. Um, and, and so I, I get these metrics for the calls, and, and one of them is adherence. And adherence is just how well you adhere to your schedule that they set for you. So every day you come in, you have a different schedule. So, like, I always work the same hours, but within that, my breaks are a different time, um, and my lunch is a different time every day. And, and so, and it goes by the second, which is really fun. And, and you look at the computer and it's synced up perfectly with our phones in which we clock in. And so I've learned how to do it by the second. And so it became a challenge to me to get a perfect adherence, no, which is impossible. It is impossible to get a perfect adherence. Trust me, I know I have a 99.75, but it's impossible to get the perfect adherence. It turned it into a game. It's, it's how I get through life. So part of this was, uh, when, I was when I was pastoring, it would, almost became a game for me to not preach the same way every week. So like sometimes it would be like heavy in scripture and it would just be like, hey, we're just going to read this. We're going to read chapter, you know, 27 of Leviticus and we're just going to, we're going to hit it hard. Other times it'd be more topical and it'd be more current events. It would be, you know, here's the verse, where here's my three points, here's my transition sentences, here's the proper structure and how you preach a sermon. So I don't like to be constricted into a box. So uh, Darlene had, had sent me an email early, early in the week. It was like, hey, do you have a sermon title for this, for this week? And, you, you know, you have a scripture reference I can put in the bulletin? Or do you need me to do anything else for you as far as the bulletin's concerned? I'm more than happy, you know, whatever. And, and I just politely responded back to her and said, I don't really have anything for that. And I did that because I don't really like to be constricted. Because part of this, too, is that how I construct sermons uh, is, is very 
very different than most other pastors. And, and, and not that there aren't pastors who do it like me, but every time I've ever been in a pastoral role, or as the same as this week when I was filling in, I worked another 40-hour week job. And so it wasn't the same, it wasn't the ability to do a construction of a, of a sermon the, the way that the traditional mindset that you would have of a pastor. We'll just leave it at that. So I like to have the freedom to, to kind of go with however God leads come Sunday morning. So the title for today's sermon is Life Unscripted. God gave me a title last night. Isn't that amazing? All right, New Year's Eve. We're coming up on New Year's Eve. Next year's the new year. Comes every year. We always have a new year. Isn't it amazing? Uh, and, and so we're going to look, we're going to look at, we're going to look forward to New Year's and expectations. Anytime we, we think about the new year, we usually, the first thing that comes to our mind is, is, well, it's one of two things, either resolutions that we're not going to keep or it's a diet, right? Isn't that how it works? Well, everybody starts to diet. Come, you know, once we get past the holidays, you know, that we'll not keep for a week or whatever, however the case may be either. But, but, but there's always this big push for us to, to have some resolution. To, to You know, we're going to make this year better than last year. We're going to do whatever we can in our power, in our strength, under our control to improve our life. That, that's, the, that's basically what we've turned New Year's Eve, as we're waiting around for the ball to drop, that's what we've turned it into. And when it comes to our life with Christ, we like that. We've come to find out that we like to have a script. We like to know what's going to happen next. We like to know where it is that we are to be, what we're to say, how we're to act. We like for things to make sense and for us to see, okay, this happens, then we do this. We like to have a, a formula for Christianity. And, and a script is a really good good image of that. When we, we think about, we just had a really awesome, uh, shameless plug here, we just had a really awesome children's program. I don't know if you happen to see that or not. Yeah, yeah. It was spectacular. My wife did a lot of work on that. She did a great job. I helped a little. It's mostly her. Uh, but it was, it was awesome. And, and, but when we were doing that, and this is how, this is how you, you practice for, for plays, for dramas, for theater. We broke it up into sections. We learned each little section of time. We didn't just go in the first day with all the kids and like had them start doing a full run through. No, we, we pulled it out. We learned each song. We learned each sign language. We learned each individual part. We broke it down so it was easy for us, to, for the kids to learn it and to master it. To, to be able to practice their part specifically or the part that they're a part of. And we went over it and over it and over it and over it until we had it pretty well, pretty well done. That's kind of how we like to have our Christianity, isn't it? We just have order and structure and we like it broken down into little pieces that we can master so that we can, you know, pull out our Christianity card be like, this is how I tithe. This is how I go to Sunday school. This is how I pray before my meals, as long as no one else is around, in my head, silently. Whatever the case is, we like to have uh, our Christianity in, in a very orderly fashion where we have a script to follow, to where we know where we're supposed to step in the stage of life. When we we're know when, okay, when they say this, this is how I respond. Well, we know how to hit our marks. We know how to, how to follow the script that, that we have before us. What's interesting about this is that it's not even that we have to be the, the writer or the director. We just want to have the script before us. We have gotten to the point in Christianity where we're willing to say, God, you're the director of, of the life. You're director. We're giving you full control. As long as you tell us and give it to us laid out perfectly for us to understand and have be able to process and to be ready to go to where then you send us out in the proper time and everything is perfect for us. But you can write whatever you like as long as you follow our stipulations. 
give you a, a further insight to me. Uh, I'm, I'm really that way in life. Like, I'm really that way. Like, if we're going on a family trip. It doesn't even have to be a big trip. I won't bring up the whole debacle when we went to the Outer Banks and how that all happened. But it could just be a day trip that, has been, that we have agreed upon the terms. We've agreed upon the terms. This is what time we're leaving. This is what vehicles we're taking. This is where the kids' car seats are going to be. And, and we're just good. I'm great with that. And then let's just do that. Let's do that. That's great. Let's do that. I am in the wrong family. <laughs> Inevitably, that's not how it works. We got to move car seats and shift around, and there's always something. You know, the wipers go out on your vehicle, and that happens all the time. Uh, it just, actually today, literally one of the wipers fell off of our vehicle. Okay, it, it just, it happens. Life happens. Life doesn't work that way, especially in our family. That's a struggle for me. That's a personal struggle for me. Why? Because we agreed upon the terms of our trip. We agreed that this is the time we were leaving. These were the vehicles we were taking. And let's all do that so I can have some fun too. But that's not Christianity. Christianity, having a relationship with Christ, is improv. It's improvisation. It's playing off of one another. It's us following Jesus' lead. Following the Holy Spirit's promptings. That's Christianity. Christianity isn't about following the script. Christianity isn't about doing the things that we're supposed to do when we're supposed to do them. Christianity is about listening to the Holy Spirit and what God has to say for our life and responding in, t- in, in kind to that in His timing, in His way, and the way that He wants us to do it. And responding to Him. That's Christianity, and that's improv. We look in Scripture, Old and New Testament, and what are the terms that we most often hear when it's in relationship to, when in in reference to our relationship? It's about trust. Trust in me. It's about not not doing what we think is best. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge Him. It's about living out of faith. It's about carrying each other's burdens. That's what Scripture's about. Scripture's not about a scripting. This is not about, here's the, here's the perfe- perfect roadmap that will tell you how to live your life every single minute of every single day and what you should say. Now you may say, well, isn't that exactly what it is? Yes and no. Yes, it is because it tells us how to live our life. And that is to live a holy life that is directed by the Holy Spirit filled inside of us that will tell us exactly what to do and what to say, when to say it in our life every single minute of every single day. But we're not going to find in here what I'm supposed to eat for lunch today. But have you ever prayed about what I should eat for lunch today? Because maybe we should, because maybe that'll take us to a restaurant that we wouldn't normally go to, so we'll run into somebody we wouldn't normally have run into, so that we can just share a kind word or make pray for them. But maybe, maybe we have a tradition with Sundays, and that's fine. Maybe we always eat the same things at the same place and see the same people. As long as we're still living by the Holy Spirit in that tradition, we'll still be okay. But in our tradition, if it's about coming to come to check mark our attendance, if it's about giving to give to check mark that we did give, if it's about coming just to be fed and not to lift up and encourage one another, and we miss the mark. Then we're living life by a script and not by the improvisation that is Christianity. 
Turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. Now this is right smack dab in the middle. And it's more towards the beginning, but we're already in the Sermon on the Mount. Now while you're pulling up to Matthew chapter 5, and today I'll be reading out of the NIV. As you're, as you're pulling in Matthew chapter 5, I'm going to give you a little insight to the Sermon on the Mount. Now there's two main streams of thought, there's other sub-thoughts off of this, but there's two main streams of thought that the Sermon on the Mount was either an individually very long sermon or was a collection of multiple sermons by which Jesus gave. But the bottom line is, from a context standpoint, that doesn't matter. Because these are Jesus' words that he was speaking to his followers. Now it starts off in chapter 5 of of the Beatitudes, which are are perfect and great and wonderful, but we're going to skip right over those. We're going to start in verse 13. We're going to skip through a few different passages here in in Matthew chapter 5, but verse 13 Verses 13 through 16. You see, what Jesus just did with the Beatitudes was was explaining how we are to behave. But here, in the remaining portion after that, Jesus is about to flip the script. He's about to flip the script on his followers. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 through 16, again today, out of the NIV. You are the salt of the earth, But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Jesus flipped the script because he did not want us to just exist in the world. He said, you are the light and the salt of the world. You are to be there to preserve. You are to be there to be the light of the world. You are to stand out. You aren't just to exist in the world. You are to be something different. You are to act different. You are to look different. You are to speak different. And it's not out of duty. It's not out of conformity. It's not out of being good person. It's not out of being a good Christian. We are to do those things, act differently, be holy. We are to do that out of the Holy Spirit living in us. It's not about a formula. It's not about if I attend this many services and I say this many nice things, that'll get me to heaven. It's not about that. It's never been about that. It's never been about that. You said to gain interest in heaven, believe in your heart, confess with your lips that I am your Lord. Let me be your Lord and Savior in your life. The point of Christianity is not to see what we can do in this world and get away with and still be a Christian. The point of Christianity is to see how close we can get with Christ. The point of Christianity is not to create some magic formula and to some adherence to some eternal schedule just to get to the other side so that we can be with Jesus. The point of Christianity is to live an improvisational life with Christ, playing off of his promptings, his leadings in our life. It comes to mind when, when Jesus uh, is sharing this. It's actually John chapter 17, uh, and it's a, a very familiar passage I think a lot of times we actually assign this mantra, this phrase, to Paul. Paul says something very similar in 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Uh, he, he says something very similar to this, and so I think sometimes we, we, we assign it to him. But this was actually Jesus actually said this in John chapter 17. Actually, I'm going to turn to John 17 because I want to read it. And, and you, you, this will be familiar to you. I'll, I'll then I'll rephrase the phrase that, that we say. John chapter 17, verse 13 through 19. I'm coming to you now, but I say these things while I'm still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word, and your world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one, that they are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth, and you have sent me into the world. I have sent them into the world." 
For them I sanctify myself, that they too may truly be sanctified. And this is Jesus' prayer for his disciples. We've all heard the phrase, be in the world but not of the world. Right? Yes. I saw three nods. There we go. I know you've heard it. I know you've heard it. Be in the world, not of the world. For a long time, I literally thought that Paul said that, like, in Romans. I, I, you know, it's like Romans 6, 27. It's, Paul says, be in the world, not of the world. Like, that's how gospel it has become in, in our churches, in, in Christianity today. But it's really, it's not even what Jesus was saying here. It's really a poor paraphrase of Jesus assigned to Paul. What does it really say? It really says should not be of the world, but be sent into the world. Should not be of the world, you should be sent into the world. You see, if we're in the world, but not of the world, what that's talking about is exclusivity. That says we're different just by we're we're keeping ourselves completely separated out. We, We keep an arm extended. We don't dare cross into places that are dangerous places. We don't dare go into places that may be considered dark. We don't dare go enter into conversations or with people who might be dirty. We don't do those things because we are in the world, but not of the world. I don't ever want to be accused of being of the world. That's not what Jesus did. That's not why Jesus came here. That's not what Jesus did when he sent his 72 out, two by two in Luke chapter 10. That's not what he did. That was never with his intention. And his own prayer in John chapter 17 was to send them into the world. Don't be of the world, but I'm sending you into it. How can we survive like that? How can we survive? How, how is it possible that we can be sent to the world and not become of it. Well, the only way possible is to live a life through the Holy Spirit. That's the only way to live a holy life. And guess what? When we live a holy life, when we live a life that we are being corrected by God, that we are being convicted by God, when we are being challenged by God, guess what? Our verbiage, our language will be different. We'll say things differently. Suddenly, we won't focus on things we used to focus on. Our actions will be different. People will know us by what? By our love. That's how they know us. And a love that doesn't come from us. A love that is radical to this world. A love that comes from God. So how are we different? How are we to be different? In Matthew chapter 5, we're back there. Let's go back. 5, 27 through 30. And here again, Jesus flips the script. This whole section after the Beatitudes, Jesus just flipping the script. How about this one? How about this one as a life issue in our world today? Guess what? It was a life issue in the world then too. But this is a life issue in our world. This is a life issue in our pulpits. This is a life issue in our church leadership. This is a life issue in our church homes, our Christian homes. This is a life issue. 5, 27 to 30. You've heard it said, do not commit adultery, but I tell you, anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away, for it is better for you to lose one part of your body than your whole body to go into hell. If there is a A place in your house that causes you to sin, move the place. If there is a device in your life that causes you to sin, throw it out. If you look at men, if you look at a woman lustfully, you're committing adultery. That's what Jesus flipping the script right here. Pornography is an issue in our world. Pornography is an issue with our men in the Christian world and in the church and in our pulpits and in our church leadership. Pornography is an issue. And part of the issue with pornography is that we have created this culture that objectifies women. Now, don't, don't, don't get me wrong here. I'm not going to go all feminist on us you know, uber liberal here. I'm not going to get us to a place where you're going to be like, let's, you know, throw them out. 
You've heard the term rape culture. It gets thrown around a lot, a lot in the media today. But there's some truth. There's some truth to how we as men, men, I'm talking to you, how we treat women in front of our children, how we speak to them, it's a problem. It's a problem that I, how I treat my wife in front of my little boy and in front of my little girls forever shapes how they understand and how they respect women. We have created a habitat for lust. We've created a habitat for pornography because of how we treat and speak of women. Regardless of where you're at with any other, whew, almost lost it there, with any other issue, with any other situation, wherever you're at with pornography, regardless of that, how we treat women, how we respect women, how we hold them up, how we support them, how we encourage them, how we don't just expect them to be our servant. How, you know, when was the last time you held a door? When's the last time that we walked around and opened the door for our wives or our girlfriends? Or the random lady who's getting ready to walk out the door. Now this is going to be one of those back in the good old days. But back in the good old days, there was something cool. There was an expectation. Now, there were still issues. There were still problems. There were still things that were going on in homes. And maybe people didn't get divorces, but people were still being abused. That wasn't right. So I'm not saying, hey, we just need to go back to the 50s. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is we need to recapture in our lives and in our children teaching respect and manners. But guess what? Guess where that starts? That doesn't start at school. That's not the school's responsibility. Guess what? That's not our Sunday school teacher's responsibility. Sending our kids to Sunday school, which is great. I'm going to say, plug, send your kids to Sunday school. That's Mike. Told him. Send the kids to Sunday school. It's awesome. But it's not Sunday school's job. It's not our Sunday school teacher's job to teach our kids manners. Guess whose job that is? Guess whose job it is for me to be a great example of being a man to my kids? It's my job. That's my me. How are we different? How are we different from the world? How are we different from our coworkers? How are we different on how we consume entertainment? Oh boy. Now he's going to go talk about immigration. Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 through 48. Let's just get it all out there. You've heard it said, love your enemies and love your neighbor and hate your enemies. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of, of your Father in heaven. Jesus flips the script here. He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good. He sends the rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the pitiful tax collectors? Are they not even doing that? And if you greet only your brothers, what, what are you doing more than anyone else? Don't even the pagans do that? Be perfect. And I'd be saying perfect. Be holy. Be holy. As your heavenly Father is holy. Someone of another faith A Muslim. Does that automatically make them our enemy? Who cares? Jesus doesn't care. Guess what? Even if they are a jihadist, even if they are an enemy, even if they're just a normal, human, peaceful being on this world, guess what? It doesn't matter because it shouldn't matter how we treat them because God calls us to treat everyone the same and love them the same. What if they smell? Who cares? What if they drive an awesome, expensive car? Who cares? What if they wear really nice clothes? Who cares? What if they wear rags? Who cares? Not Jesus. 
What if we've perceived them to be out to get us? What does the Bible tell us? The Bible tells us as much as it depends on us to live in peace with all men. Who cares? Is it our job? Is it individually? Maybe institutionally. That's another discussion for another day. Maybe on a government level. That's another discussion for another day. Is it our job to care whether or not we let 10,000 Syrian refugees come into this country? Or is it our job that when we meet a person on the street or in our classroom or in our, our work environment that needs help or needs assistance or needs a prayer or needs a hug or needs a kind word or needs $10, is it our job to respond to whatever the prompting of the Holy Spirit is and for us to do whatever God says for us to do, to reach out and give to the needy, to reach out and provide shelter, to reach out and, and clothe the warm, to reach out and surround them with God's loving arms, to be a radical difference in their life so that when they see us, they see someone different than this world. Because remember, we're not of the world. We're sent into the world. How are we different? Jesus has called us to love regardless. That's how we're different. So let's consider a situation. Turn over to Matthew chapter 14. While you're there, I'm going to completely go off onto a different path and a tangent because it's just what's going to happen. Is uh, I was just looking down and I, I numbered my pages and, and it, I recall back to my very first, well, it was my second sermon ever. It was my very first sermon on a Sunday morning. My very, 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 very first sermon was on a Sunday night. And I practiced and I studied and I had everything and I even defined a word using the same word again. Um, so that was great. Uh, and it's, it's, it's from my favorite passage because, well, it was... It was Philippians chapter 2. Go read it sometime. It's awesome. I worked really hard and I had a 10 minute sermon. It was spectacular. Three people went to the altar. 16 years old. My youth leader comes up to me and she says to me at right after service, you did a wonderful job. She's so encouraging. You did a wonderful job. Now next, next time, which was like three weeks from there, I was going to preach on Sunday morning. And she said, now it needs to be a little longer when you preach on Sunday morning. So I get to this point right now, what I just remembered, I look down, I see a page number on my page. I've been preaching for 45 minutes. And I say to the congregation, I say, okay, now we're going to page three. And, uh, and my, my stepmom was in the audience. And she, she quipped really loud because we were 45 minutes into the service. And she said, yeah, but out of how many pages? Thankfully, it was only page, four pages. So we were, we were almost through. I just looked down. I saw and we're on page seven. I won't tell you how many. Smaller pages today. Matthew chapter 14. Verses 13 through 21. Very, very familiar passage to us. Here is a prime example in which Jesus flips the script in a real life ministry situation on the disciples. Matthew chapter 14 Verse 13 through 21, you know it. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. And when Jesus landed, he saw a large crowd, and he had compassion on them, and he healed the sick. And as evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Can you imagine being the disciples here? The disciples at this point, they, they, they've gone through this. They, they've gone through a multiple times since they've gone from town to town. They've had the large crowds. Uh, and and I'm, without a doubt, they all had their certain jobs to do. Whether it was scoping out the location to make sure we had a good venue to have a natural amphitheater or however the case was. If it was you know, providing food or shelter or housing or going before or making local contacts. They all had their job to do. Can you imagine the anxiety and the stress? Now it says that there was 5,000, we'll read that part, there's 5,000 men and so who knows how many additional women and children were in this crowd. But can you imagine being the one who's responsible for feeding them? Hey, um, Jesus, uh, you know, it's getting almost mealtime. Don't you think it'd be a good idea to, you know, let's send them off. They can go get some food and 
you know, I'm sure people will be more responsive to you if, if they had a full belly, you know. Uh, it, it, there, was, there was a certain level of anxiety that would have, would have came up. And she said, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. I don't know about you, but if right now I turned to one of you and said, hey, why don't you just have a meal ready here in the next 25 minutes for everybody that's here and we'll just all stay and I'll just keep talking. Just go ahead and make a meal. For just this crowd. Can you imagine that same kind of, for, for let's say 8,000 people, 10,000 people, however many there were. The number isn't as important as the fact that the the script was being flipped. Well, we're in luck because we've already done our job and we have discovered that here we have five loaves of bread and two fish. And Jesus says, bring them to me. And he directed people to sit down in the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven. He gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. And they all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men besides women and children. Flip the script. Went against what this world would believe to be a possibility. And he performed a miracle. See, miracles happen in the improvs of life. Miracles don't happen when we follow our script. Miracles happen when we trust, when we rely on, when we lean on, when we're willing to go off of the script, when we are willing to live a life unscripted. Currently, uh, that's what we're doing in our life, living a life unscripted. I mentioned I was a pastor at two different churches, and, and it um, became a situation where we weren't, will, we weren't able, we weren't willing, we weren't willing to meet the demands of ministry and sacrifice our children. I wasn't willing to work a 40-hour job outside of being a senior pastor, only so that there was no one else to care for our children and they weren't, their spiritual needs weren't being met and they were just being a cumbersome bother. An inconvenience. And we prayed and we prayed and we prayed and we prayed and we prayed. And God told me, okay, And that's all he told me. Nothing else. And so I prayed. I was like, okay, all right, I heard an okay. What's that mean? And prayed, and I prayed, and I prayed. And he laid out a plan, and it was such a great plan. It's an awesome plan. It's spectacular. It's so in detail, and he just knows me so well. He said, job? House? church. Awesome. Okay. At random, I, uh, I got a job at Chase with no banking experience, uh, and, and it w- happened really quickly. And uh, that happens a lot at Chase. Don't worry. Uh, I'm an expert now. Um, literally. Um, I, 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 so we got a job, but then we didn't have a house. And so then we went and bought an RV which was a spectacular adventure. And um, we, we, we had some, some kind, gracious, they didn't even know how gracious, because um, it got better, uh, kind and gracious family, uh, Jason and Sarah, who let us put it on their property. They're, they're at their place. They're outside of the city limits. Looked up, you know, it was all cool, zoning and everything. No big deal. Outside the city limits, we're fine. So we lived in this RV. So um, for a while, I when I started my other job while I was still finishing up uh, at the church, I was coming every night. And Jeremiah, who uh, isn't here today, uh, he 
he came a lot of times after work and helped me, and we, we renovated the inside of the RV and got it all livable and nice and, and everything else. And, and, and when we were still not certain as to where we were going to attend church. Now, when, when God said church, I understood that it wasn't, hey, you're going to go lead a church, because that was the whole reason why we're leaving. So he said, but he said church, and uh, one day, out of the blue, with no prompting, no, no heads up, we hear a, a doorbell ring and a knock on the door, and we open the door, and there stands Pastor Mike. came visited us up in Lexington, and just... We knew <laughs> at that point, like we just knew. It's so gracious and so wonderful and, and just so honoring of an understanding of, of what we're going through and, and, and the need for a sabbatical, essentially. Um, and so we, we, we had a job. We had a, a house, an RV, someone else's place. And we, we had a church. And we've been here since. And guess what? I, there's no next step for us. Um, and, and as I mentioned before, that's a problem for me. Which is probably why we are living in this time in our life. You see, it's in those times when we have no script to follow, when we're completely reliant on God, it's where the growth occurs. It's where we're challenged. That's where we're expanded. That's where our faith is increased. So even though things, things are never, grass is never greener on the other side, right? It's never greener on this side. It's always greener on this side until you get there. One of my favorite titles of books is Grass is Always Greener Over the Septic Tank. It's a real book title. It really is. There's always going to be issues. There's always going to be problems. There's always going to be life stresses. You know, there's always going to be that neighbor who, you know, calls the fire department and the health department and the police department and the zoning department. And then you have to randomly move out of your, your RV that you then have to sell. And then you have to move into the basement. And then you almost lose your job because you called off a second time in your probationary period. And you thought you could call off twice, but you could only call off one time. Life is always stressful. If we would have left ministry, our post, to run away from stress, we're running away for the wrong reason. But if we left because God said go, then we're there for the right reason. If we left because it didn't follow the script that we thought it was going to follow, we left for the wrong reason. But if we left because we're following the improvisations of Christ, the Holy Spirit, and that's where we're just going to be. Matthew chapter 19. We're, just, we're sticking with Matthew. Matthew chapter 19. I tell you what, I, I know I jumped into John a little bit, but that's just because I had to get Jesus' prayers in the right word there. Matthew's actually not my favorite gospel. You know, you all have favorite gospels, right? My favorite gospel is the gospel of Luke, of course. Great name. Spectacular. Luke's a physician. He just, he, just, he just gets the information just exactly how I like it. But we're in Matthew today. Matthew chapter 19. I don't know if... <laughs> I don't know if Jesus flipped the script in your life or if you've allowed him to flip the script in your life or if you're going to allow him to do that to you here in 2016. See, we're, we're staying with the theme here of this coming year and the expectations. 19, 16 through 21. The rich young ruler. See, his life, his, flip got scripted, his script got flipped. Now a man came to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied, there's only one who is good. If you want to enter life, obey the commandments. Which ones, the man inquired. And Jesus replied, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false witness, testimony, honor your father and mother, love your neighbor as yourself. All these I have kept since a young man. What do I still lack? Jesus answered, 
If you want to be holy, go, sell your possessions, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. The man heard this. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Now, for this man, at this time, this is what Jesus said, here's how you get this, flip. we got to flip your script. For you, you've done the right things. You've been a good church folk, going folk. You've followed the commandments. You've kept the laws. And you've been blessed for it. You're a man of great wealth. But that is, for you, has become more about doing things. Things. What must I do to get into heaven? It's not about doing things. You're still in the old covenant. The old covenant was about doing things. The new covenant, it's about being with Christ. The old covenant was about sacrifices. The new covenant, there was one sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice that lasts forever. The old covenant, that's about doing things, keeping commands. The new covenant with Jesus Christ, we're going to keep those commands. Isn't that amazing? We're going to keep those commands out of our relationship with him. Sell all your possessions. Give it away to the poor. Follow me. It's not about accumulating stuff. It's not about doing the right things. It's not about keeping the commandments. It's not about your actions. It's not about your behaviors. It's about being one with Christ. And guess what? The rest will come. Don't you think that Jesus is going to have us follow the commandments? Don't you think if we're living a holy life, a life that is led by the Holy Spirit, that we're going to treat people the right way if we're listening to God? Don't you think that we're going to honor Him in all the areas of our life if we are truly seeking Him and following what He has for us? Living a holy life dependent on the Holy Spirit? All that other stuff of the old covenant, we're going to satisfy that in our relationship with Christ. Jesus flipped the script. Maybe in our life and how we've been raised in church, and maybe we've been in church our whole life, maybe we've been in church for just a few times, but maybe we have an understanding of church. Well, church is about rules. It's about being exclusive and keeping people out. It's about giving money. Those are things that I think the world generally thinks of church or of Christianity. Maybe that's what we have lived our life that way. Why are you here today? Are you here today out of duty? Are you here today out of practice? Are you here today out of tradition? Are you here today because you want to check mark your box and say, hey, I got perfect attendance? Or are you here today to meet Christ, to hear a word, to share an encouraging word to your brother or sister? The point of church is to commune with God and commune with each other. That's the point of church. It's the point of service. It's for encouragement to one another. The point of coming to church is not to give money. Guess what? God wants us to give our tithe to the church. He might even tell you to give a little extra. If we're listening to Him, we're going to be in the right. But if we're doing it out of tradition or we're doing it out of our script, if we're doing it so we hit our mark and we say the right things at the right time, we're limited. We don't get to experience the miracles that happen in the improvisations with Jesus Christ. So our challenge, our challenge today, our challenge for this coming year, our challenge is the same challenge that Jesus gave to the rich young ruler now, it may not be sell all your possessions and give to the poor. Maybe it's something else. Maybe it's fill in the blank for you in your own heart. But the second part, the second part, and follow me. 
our challenge today in this coming year is to see how close we can get to Christ. Our challenge is to be different than the world. Our challenge for 2016 is to live a holy life so that they see that we are different from them. That's our challenge. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Lord, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for this opportunity for us to gather here together in your name to worship you, to glorify you. Praise you, Father. May we have a, may we accept this challenge for this coming year to be different for you to depend on you for wisdom, guidance, direction. Thank you, Lord. Be with us now as we leave this place. Bless us as we go. And out from here that we may seek out opportunities to live in the improv of life with you. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.